International Young Scholars Summit 2020. This international forum aims to bring together rigorous and erudite young scholars from all over the world over a single platform. The aim is to create an academic space to encourage young scholars and academicians from the field of international relations, political science, diplomacy, public policy, administration, and all the related subfields. The conference will be held for three days consecutively to 30 different sessions, which are running parallel in the white and the green room through this conference. The conference will feature 275 scholars from 25 different countries who will be delivering their presentation and sharing their understanding with us. This session is streaming right now live on YouTube, so please feel free to share it on all your social media handles with the hashtag IYSS2020. This is the 27th session of the conference and to chair and moderate this session, it is an honor to have Dr. Anna Velikaya here with us today. She is a research fellow at the Prima Kov National Research Institute of the World Economy and International Relations, Russian Academy of Sciences. She graduated from Siberian OMSK State University in 2007, where she holds a degree in marketing. She holds an MA and PhD from Moscow State Institute of International Relations. Her 2014 thesis include was about humanitarian cooperation of the CIS states. She is the co-editor of the Greg Simons of the Russia's Public Policy, Paul Grave Macmillan, 2019. Her current research focuses on public diplomacy, humanitarian policy, U.S. politics in Central Asia. She specializes in humanitarian cooperation at the Moscow State Institute of International Relations and has co-authored Modern International Relations 2017 and Public Diplomacy of Russia and Foreign Countries. Her research interests include public diplomacy, humanitarian cooperation, nation building, track to diplomacy, and U.S. politics in Central Asia. Without any further ado, let me request her to moderate the session. It's a great pleasure to have all of you with us on board. Welcome. Mm -hmm. Hello, dear colleagues from Moscow, warmest wishes. I'd like to first of all thank uh, Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement for this honor to chair this wonderful session with young scholars uh, and uh, practitioners that will be devoted to burning issues of international relations. And uh, I would like to present our distinguished panelists. Everyone uh, would have a time limit of uh, 10 minutes. And later, if we have time, we will uh, proceed to Q&A session. And when there is one minute left, uh, I will tell about it uh, to our esteemed uh, panelists. Uh, our today's first speaker is uh, Priyanka Patel, research scholar, Central University of Gujarat, India. And her topic is Israel's defense research and development. What can India learn? Dear Priyanka, the floor is yours. And please, sorry me if I spell your name miscorrectly. Thanks. So, um, thank you so much. It's all right. <laughs> uh, so first of all, I would like to thank Nice for having me here and allowing me to speak on this uh, in this session. So, uh, as there is time constraint, I would only highlight the major arguments of the paper. The topic is Israel's defense research and development. What can India learn? So uh, it is well known about the Israel as it is a startup nation and has done a lot since its uh, independence. Uh, why I have chosen its study with India because there are many similarities in these two countries. But when we look at the trajectory since their independence to uh, till date, uh, they are diversing apart. Where Israel has been one of the most, uh, uh, it is one of the world's leading defense exporters. At the same time, India has become one of the top defense importers of the world. So for Israel, it is a remarkable achievement as it is one of the smallest countries in the world. Last year in 2019, according to Global Innovation Index, Israel was ranked uh, fifth in the top 10. But India at the same time, if we look at India, we were at the 52nd. That is a major difference is seen. Uh, next, uh, when we see the what why I was talking about the similarities in both these countries, uh, the 
approximately the freedom of their time when they attain freedom it is approximately more or less same also both of them are home to earlier civilizations and surrounded by enemies what must be highlighted here is that israel has israel has a little amount of natural resources including water and its larger part is arid and any country with such uh, diverse conditions would have given and largely become dependent on allies but israel is not the case it knows well how to turn challenges into opportunities thus it decided to focus on its intellect human intellectual capital to create a knowledge based economy now knowing the importance of uh, education system for the innovation and other purposes uh, what they are doing it is uh, israel spends 7% of its gdp on its education system and almost half of the population goes through higher education it invests about 4.2% of gdp in research and development which is highest in the world and among this uh, approximately third part goes to universities now as i am talking about the uh, defense research and development it is uh, it will be nice to look at the uh, israel's defense industries how they have evolved over a period of time so it is surrounded by uh, enemies and fighting terrorism mostly all the time so it invests heavily in cutting edge technologies for the security of the nation uh, the trajectory uh, the trajectory of israel's defense innovation success when we go through it it also in the beginning it was uh, heavily relied on imports but after it faced an embargo in 1967 by the french uh, its policy shifted major to self reliance self sufficiency in major battle platforms through indigenous research development and fabrication when we lo uh, look at the uh, israel's uh, history of defense industries there are many four, success four successive eras first is the prehistoric state when it was when it did not attain freedom it was the uh, it was the time of underground munition industries which later on started developing own its own light weapons and manufacturing facilities the next comes the for uh, the formative era from the establishment of israel in 1948 to the six day war in 1967 it was the time when country's technological capabilities were launched in both the civilian and mil uh, military industries uh, the next stage is the munitions uh, sorry uh, this was the second stage was also the stage when it faced the french embargo following the six days war in 1967 the, then the then comes the third stage the munitions independence era it was from the six day war in 1967 to the termination of lavi fighter aircraft program in august 1987 uh this was the time when israel embarked on the indigenous design and manufacturing of combat aircraft mbts and warships it was the time when sar boat series were uh, made fast patrol vessels of zivit class and mbt merkava the last stage fo i followed it started from 1987 and it is going on until now it was the time when it focused on the policy of focused self reliance under which only those systems are to be developed by israeli defense industries which are force multiplier and are uniquely tailored for the israeli defense forces and thus do not exist anywhere else or such systems which are denied to israel due to some political obstruction it is seen that wherever any whenever any system is denied to israel or it had felt for a particular type of equipment due to its own ground experiences it has developed it on its own also the exigencies of the battlefield have dictated the direction of its defense industries while israel pioneered the field of anti ship missiles it was also the first country to lose a warship to an anti ship missiles uh, and uh, this followed the for, uh, from for the creation of barak first with the help of india it was a joint collaboration between israel and india it is also see uh, no sorry the another important feature of israel defense industry is the conversion and upgrading of combat and commercial platforms it uh, here we see that israeli military is itself a national incubator and a significant catalyst for innovation uh thing here to note that in israel the military service is compulsory for all youth thus based on talent and aptitude they get a good exposure to the latest military technology and thus they learn to work in a coordinated and disciplined manner in israel majorly all the defense firms are government but knowing the economic and management realities they are getting divested of government control 
however it is a gradual process now when we come to human resources there are basically two points the first is the which i talked about uh, compulsory military service which is a driving force behind israel's military and technological industry the next is the culture the culture in israel is that of a creative chaos which is conducive to innovative out of the box thinking now when i come to what can india learn the first is the india needs to focus on its education system and research and development just opposite to israel india spends 4.6% on its education which is far less than israel and only a half quarter of youth goes for higher education only a quarter sorry not half only a quarter of youth goes for higher education and that too is of a low grade india spends nearly 0.6 to 0.7% in research and development and within that only a meager portion goes to universities which is the place where major youth is found who are the innovation doers also unlike israel indian education system discourages being questioned or questioning which is one of the most important traits of the innovation also we need to focus on our higher education system which is a striving for we have to strive for quality rather than quantity here the government has to play a major role in this it is critical to improve our research and development and needs much funding like isro we need incubators incubators israel has about 20 a good example from india is the innovation center at national chemical laboratory and in pune uh, also the many experts have faulted india's innovation that focuses on getting products and services to people at an affordable cost rather than aiming for global leadership however solving india's challenges will eventually open opportunities for indian enterprises globally this is exactly what is right did another important area for government support is exploring darpa this is defense advanced research projects agency model from us which the israel follows the program managers from darpa are industry veterans and are experts in specific domain areas in india uh, drdo is much known but it is all uh, government agency which needs reevaluation recently a committee is also constituted for this purpose uh, now israel from israel we have develop sorry as we have seen above israel has developed a lot from its experiences india has also seen major wars and is surrounded by enemies yet we have not it, uh, witnessed any such significant in the wake of these events also as israel defense industries uh, i have talked about fabrication uh, two three points before this is related to that only Uh, when unable to get first class systems the israelis maintained and overhauled the vintage ones and by learning from them they developed their own on the contrary india although has such vintage and old systems but we could not see any innovation of this type next comes the indian private sector which has long been kept out of defense domain this is a serious concern okay the last is the it sector here india has done a great job but the time has now ripened to use those capabilities in product research and development and ip creation to conclude there are some aspects aspects of the culture that are common across both these countries india and israel for example the ability to do more with the less with constant resources these abilities in india need to be encouraged and rewarded we see that is there are there are a lot of things from in israel from which india can learn in fact india is on the upper hand being a natural resource and human capital in abundance the need is only the proper steps in proper direction under a coordinated and integrated approach thank you so much thank you dear priyanka and i would like to ask you about scientific cooperation of israel and united arab emirates regarding the recent deal and now they have signed a memorandum of understanding with uh, mohammed bin zayed university of uae on the cooperation in the sphere of artificial intelligence do you think that it would be full scale cooperation or just memorandum of understanding So could you please uh, answer it? Uh, uh, you, uh, uh, yeah, ma'am. I, actually, I I have read about these, but I, I am not very familiar about uh, these things. Okay. I'm just working on that. Okay. Okay. Just one initially. Okay. okay. Thanks a lot. I'm looking for that. Uh, thank you very much, and okay. uh, thank you for your presentation. Now.
I would like to present our next uh, speaker. It's uh, Malavi Kanandan, student at St. Joseph's College, India. And the topic is uh, BRI, Brazil, Russia, India, aspects of geostrategy and geoeconomics. Uh, the floor is yours, dear Malavika. Uh, thank you, Chair. Good afternoon to all. Could you screen, uh, see my screen? Just maybe in a second. Yes, now we can see it. Yes, we can see it. So I'll start my presentation. So my topic is One Belt, One Road, Aspects of Geostrategy and Geoeconomics. So China's Belt and Road Initiative, which is a One Belt, One Road, is a global development project that is very similar to the Silk Road. And it is made up of a belt of overland routes and road that refers to the shipping lanes. So this is one of President Xi Jinping's ambitious projects, which aims to strengthen and assert China's foreign policy, along with infrastructural developments in the neighboring countries. It also helps in the creation of a large unified market, which includes both the foreign and the domestic markets. It helps in cultural exchange and connection, and the countries that are involved tend to form bonds of trust with each other. It also helps in creating an innovative environment with capital, technology, and talent transfers. So the One Belt, One Road, which was first introduced in 2013, aims to span over 78 countries in two phases. So on land, it aims to improve connectivity and economic cooperation of Eurasia by spanning over six economic corridors. And the second phase, which is the 21st century Maritime Silk Road is sea-based and it connects to China, to Mediterranean, Africa, Central Asia and Southeast Asia. While it is definitely argued that this is one of uh, Beijing's method to gain political leverage over other countries, we cannot fully uh, disregard the economic concerns of China, which includes an effort to decrease the regional disparity and to bring in development to the hinterlands. Then it is a method to uh, reduce the country's excess capacity. So this does not really indicate dumping to other countries, but supplying uh, an establishment of factories that is required to produce in the other countries. Now, what my uh, presentation will aim at is to give a brief introduction and it will be very brief into the uh, geostrategical and geoeconomic aspects of One Belt, One Road. As a global strategy, what is ABO done is it has helped in improving the areas of policy, finance, trade and infrastructure. So if we take the case of geostrategy, as a foreign policy, ABO was brought about for uh, peripheral diplomacy. So what will peripheral diplomacy do is that it would bring about national rejuvenation by maintaining good relations with the neighbors. So there are various characteristics which prove that Obor has been uh, mainly led by geopolitical strategies, like example, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. So the CPEC corridor helps China in linking the population with uh, more than half of the world. Then the uh, marine, China's marine warships as well as the trade ships can avoid the Malacca Strait, which makes the process very inexpensive and very less time consuming. Beijing can keep an eye on the advancement that's happening in the Indian Ocean. And there are certain military benefits that it provides to China because if the Guada port is developed, it can be a naval footprint of attack submarines and to establish a foothold of Beijing in the Indian Ocean. So here, even Pakistan is getting benefited in the way that their infrastructural development they have uh, they get infrastructural development and also uh, they have an improved alliance with china in that matter now keeping uh, china and pakistan aside if we take us and china so xi jinping visited uh, us and termed it as a new model of super of major power relations instead of g2 but the relationship that they share is quite strange in fact obor is considered to be a way of a uh, strategic, it is considered to be a strategic method which is chosen by China in, in opposition to the US pivot to Asia and the Trans Pacific Partnership because Trans Pacific Partnership was one of the ways of showing the unipolar possession and dominance in Asia and it was supported with the military alliance of uh, Japan and Australia as well. And the thing is, if uh, the BRI is recognized by US. They have advantages, both the countries get equal advantages because it helps in improving the economic growth, limit infrastructure loops, and will also help in economical and trade flows. The withdrawal of US, when US withdraw from the TPP, it actually helped China to sell the idea of this one belt, one road much more effectively. In the case of economic aspects, 
the economic aspects of obor can uh, be divided into two main objectives firstly it's a chance by which they can utilize the economic integration to assert the regional leadership next so here actually china would be the center of innovation and development in the regional production chain next it would include three main concerns so first one is making use of the excess capacity that china possesses then upgrading the chinese industries and maintaining a, a good relation with the neighbors along with regional economic development so it is likely that beijing will initially like when they started off they was uh, first focus on domestic integration because it belongs in its own jurisdiction now if we take the case of like there is a regional disparity so uh, there is a lot of regional disparity that exists between the inland countries and the coastal areas state subsidies have been implemented heavily in these western provinces which resulted in the high concentration of state owned enterprises and very low private investment so that is one of the obor's objectives to make sure that they integrate them into regional economies rather than just showering them with uh, government money now china has already become a world market but the comparative advantage that it has in labor manufacturing has taken a hit therefore improving its industry and higher end products and producing the higher end products is one of its main uh, development goals as such obor aims to facilitate the export of these goods and helps help in the upgradation of the markets in the world market now uh, like i have mentioned before in the point about excess capacity which is present it helps in the it actually leads to wastage of resources it leads to surplus costs and makes a country more vulnerable so the uh, one belt one road initiative is not just about uh, produce or uh, exporting this excess uh, capacity to other countries but rather it is about uh, providing the production facilities to these countries so that they can produce it themselves now if we take the case of us us believes that the financing policy of china could lead to a uh, compromising the sovereignty of the nation so they have taken various policies to you know educate the other countries which are associated with over about the debt trap as well as uh, various financial policies that they should be following so that they don't have to compromise their sovereignty which might prove detrimental to national security and that is in fact which had happened with uh, sri lanka as well when it came into a debt trap due to which it had to give 99 year lease to china now obor helps in the uh, creating a well integrated economic area so which consists of both the hard and soft infrastructure hard infrastructure will uh, consist of the roads and the rails and soft infrastructure is mainly trade arguments so what it is said is that there is a lot of reduction in the time and the trade cost due to this uh, initiative which is obor and it is accounted almost 2.2% now uh, so if we uh, conclude it china actually uses geopolitical strategy to make the neighboring countries very closer to beijing and it plans to improve its manufacturing and technology but uh, will the the problem or the question is will the neighboring countries be willing to make use of the excess capacity that is present because there is a lot of growing tension and uh, this lack of trust that is there and china's ability to fund the projects in the long term and how and their ability to manage the projects outside their own borders will actually determine the success of this project and china's hence on a mission to become the superpower and to prove that one belt one road is an opportunity rather than a threat as most people um, consider it to be thank you thanks uh, a lot uh, dear Malavika, you're writing about Bel about Brazil, Russia, India. It's interesting to mention that uh, my student at Ranipa University was writing about Russia, India, China project uh, in her thesis about BRICS. That it will be more um, resumed to this format, and it's interesting to mention how various formats are. Analyzed, and uh, my question for you for Q and A session is: you you write that U.S. believes about Chinese policy in the region, but uh, how do you think how do the regional powers perceive these Chinese regional initiatives? Uh, could you please repeat your question? Um, you are right. In, uh, you were talking in your pre presentation uh, that U.S. believes about the threats of Chinese policies in the region, but how do regional powers yeah. perceive this Chinese uh, policy? But could you please answer it in the end of our session, okay? Yes, sure. yeah, thank you. a lot. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, and uh, now we would like to proceed to our next uh, speaker, uh, Dr.
Dr. Anna Nath Ganguly, Assistant Professor at Amity University, India, and uh, Dr. Anna's topic is Asia's Regional Security, Changing Contents of Policy and Practice. Um, very good afternoon uh, to the Chair. Uh, I, am, I have basically taken, uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, you are audible. Okay, so the topic that I've chosen is by and large a very comprehensive topic, but what I wanted to study is how Asia is faring in terms of regional security. And uh, I have a slide, but I do not want to, it's a very pictorial slide. Most of the discussion will be done by me. So let me just uh, display the ideas that I want to share here. Uh, is it visible? Yes, it's visible okay. now. So when I uh, so when I am uh, looking at Asia's regional security, what is basically that concerns that I would like to highlight, and how I see that what uh, security aspects and challenges are mostly uh, to be looked at. So when we looked at why regionalism has occurred, we basically understand that regionalism would be an answer to the hegemony of single state, and uh, regionalism would sort some of the problems that we saw with unipolar world. But often a lot of problems that we saw in unipolar and bilat you know, bipolar world are basically now just shifting and transforming to the regional space. Uh, if we look at how individual state who are exercising authority were trying to become more powerful, but then uh, that was disrupting the entire peace and stable, uh, stable order. But today, if you see within the regional order, there are single state dominance and there are more uh, hegemons being created. So this is a question that we see that whether in regional spaces we see the emergence of more single state dominance and whether it is an answer still, regionalism is an answer still to hegemony in the world. The second thing that I would like to un understand that regionalism appeared as an answer to the uh, zero sum game. But today when we see the regional uh, infighting in going on, internal conflicts going on, we basically would like to understand whether this zero-sum game has just been transferred within the regional space rather than a win-win situation, which was basic policy of the regionalism, regional integration. Now we see more of, uh, you know, uh, countries within the region fighting for a zero-sum game and looking at how Asia is such a diverse and almost the second largest with 60% population and 58 countries. So there's a lot of uh, internal conflicts going on. So hegemony and regionalism, zero-sum game within regionalism is what is my point of uh, deliberation. And also the style, the regionalism was basically a collective cooperative mechanism. But is regional orders today basically looking at collective cooperative or, or, you know, uh, mechanism or basically, again, the defense mechanisms which we saw uh, till the Cold War is basically just transformed here into the regional space. We all know that uh, Asia is one of the most, uh, by and large, the wider and the most uh, diverse group. And therefore, in Asia, when we look at all the six uh, regions of Asian continent, uh, every part is different from each other and every part has their own aspirations and their own prominence that they're trying to establish. So that's why a lot of conflicts that is happening within the regional order and the security aspects of different regions are uh, similar, but not alike. They are also different in their order. So we all have seen how uh, Southeast Asia, South Asia, West Asia, North Asia, Central Asia, all of them have the different needs and aspirations. Uh, some of the uh, underlining characteristics that I have seen what has been happening and what's going on and some of the con security concerns, though there are so many security concerns in uh, entire Asia. Uh, one is that this region is very dynamic and it is a very young population which has been un, you know, addressed by everyone. So we see a lot of population who are skill based and a lot of population who are young generation living as one or two countries. But then this uh, region has a lot of aspirations and hope and prospects. And uh, we'll see a lot of cultural assimilation here. So culture which can also become a point of assimilation, culture which can also become a point of discord. So it has been going on within Asia for a long time with uh, ethnic battles and ethnic uh, conflicts. Uh, the other thing that I would look at whether Asia from a marginal context is trying to become mainstream. And while in the process of becoming a mainstream uh, region, what kind of uh, basic challenges, complexities and critical issues are being faced? It's a melting pot. Now Asia is a melting pot because we see terrorism, ethnic conflicts and everything going on and now digital divide and maybe uh, some kind of cyber insecurity. 
so basically we have understood you know, how the basic uh, problems are evolving and daily they're escalating so asia is also looked at something as a world stage uh, there is a lot of divide but there's a lot of commonalities there's a lot of diffusion and then the kind of business now since i'm talking about asia there are two things i'm going to look at is one is the security which is traditional which is how defense and arms and military is uh, accumulating on the other hand is how trade and non traditional security is basically becoming the attention points uh, this we also know with the kind of uh, entirely how asia is contributing to artificial intelligence robotics and everything there are trade wars also going on which are basically uh, trade wars which are going on within the members of asia and there are external members opposing like the us china trade war is basically compelling other states also to be affected so hong kong is getting affected so there are so many characteristics and issues within asia region that it is not very easy to basically underline one systematic problem or one systematic solution to the problems uh, looking at security concerns we are all aware of china's hegemony we are looking at south asia civil battle looking at the korean peninsula continued escalation of conflicts how terrorism is becoming a basic challenge and, and different forums you know this has been raised on and on uh, we are looking at how arms race you know now we see in 2020 arms race is now in a state where it is uh, really increased in asia quite a lot in comparison to america and europe corruption is very intensive with the nation countries and it's a basic problem in economic prosperity we are looking at maritime disputes since asia is surrounded by sea so there are so many maritime disputes evolving which are all bone of contention and the basic thing between economic and environment but what some questions that i would like to raise which i have been trying to speculate is basically uh, first which i raise is whether regional cooperation are still antidote to hegemony the second is whether uh, asia face only the insecurity from internal players or external players all this while we have been talking that external uh, players and actors have been playing uh, you know spoils follow to the asian uh, stability but now we see that within asia there are internal players who are acting disruptors in stability the other points of attention which i want to look at between the con confusion and conflict between traditional and non traditional security which should get more attention in asia and the other points which i would like to also look at uh, though there are regional arrangements uh you know we have multi sectoral pan asia multilateral arrangements but quite often though we see track one diplomacy really strong in within asia and we also see multi track diplomacy going on very well in within asia but we also see in uh, track two there is a lack of people to people connect in lot of uh, issues uh, maybe we have seen global order with linkages Uh, looking at trade barriers now within asia going on while trade barriers was always issue between north and south and human trafficking so uh, let me just uh, just close this that this is uh, some of the recent developments we see while on the one hand we are seeing the growth market and the market share tumbling and uh, plummeting and every country is now concerned from china to uh, south korea to japan and on the other hand we are seeing the much more investment are going on in military expenditure uh, which of this uh, is more necessary for asia Thank you so much. Uh, I would stop sharing this slide. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Ganguly. And as for me, as public diplomacy enthusiast, pr practitioner, and scholar, I was gl very glad to hear about the prospects of confidence building uh, measures for Asian states and the opportunities for track two and people to people diplomacy. And thanks a lot to, uh, for covering it uh, deeply in your presentation. And thanks for Thank your wonderful presentation. Thanks a lot. And now we would like to proceed to our next speaker, and this is Bishnu Chaudhary, student at the Department of International Relations and Diplomacy, Tripurvan University, Nepal. His topic is the Israel-Palestine conflict through the perspectives of international law. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to uh, greet with warm welcome to my presentation to all the intellectuals, researchers. and my fellow young uh, scholars of uh, this conference i hope you can see my slides can you yes we can thanks so yeah uh, as uh, anna spoke earlier the topic of my presentation is going to be israel palestine conflict and how the international law is been impacted or has uh, implications on the international law 
So for the next uh, eight or nine minutes, uh, I'm going to dive into this topic. And uh, before going into the international law itself, uh, let's uh, look at the geographical location of uh, Israel in the Middle East. So we can clearly see that uh, Israel, uh, which is denoted by the orange color, is uh, surrounded by the hostile Arabian countries, uh, Syria on the north, Jordan in the east, Saudi Arabia to the south, and Egypt to the west. So uh, uh, it is very much uh, clear from uh, the map itself that uh, the main reason behind uh, this conflict, uh, you know, which has been going for uh, decades, is nothing but a difference uh, between the religio religious practices and uh, the socio-cultural uh, faith they are practicing there uh, over a long time. And uh, yeah, uh, a little bit of background uh, uh, regarding this uh, conflict. Uh, what we have been uh, seeing, I mean, what we have known uh, through history is uh, the Jewish people, uh, I mean, uh, the Jewish people who are the majority in uh, the Jewish state of Israel now, they have been, uh, you know, uh, suffering or they have been underlooked or uh, they are always uh, discriminated against since the long time of history. Uh, for example, uh, during the 13th century in Europe, uh, they already suffered religious persecutions and again they had to go through uh, mass exodus in 15th century. And it is uh, needless to talk about how the Jews or the Jewish people were exterminated mercilessly under the Nazis during the World War II. Now, uh, this uh, uh, eternal suffering or you know, the, the pain and the, uh, the embarrassment they have uh, been suffering uh, through different uh, rulers or say dictators, uh, it ultimately led them to you know, vie for establishing the, their own independent uh, Jewish state. And uh, this, uh, this was culminated in uh, 14th of May, 1948, uh, when uh, David Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister of uh, Jewish state of Israel, uh, he, along with other Zionist leaders, uh, unilaterally you know, declared the independence of uh, Israel. And now, this uh, particular date, the 14th of May, 1948, is uh, the very beginning of uh, the conflict uh, which has been ensured between the Arabian states and Israel. Uh, which is continuing uh, till today. Now, uh, of course, uh, there have been a lot of, uh, you know, the peace uh, talks and treaties uh, throughout the history. For example, uh, there was a peace talk uh, in uh, 1978 between uh, uh, the then Prime Minister of Israel, Menachem Begin, and Anwar Sadat. And uh, again, there was uh, Oslo Accords in 1993, again in 2000. Uh, uh, between Arafat and uh, the new rulers of Israel. But, you know, nevertheless, the peaceful accords and the treaties, uh, it has been, uh, you know, uh, highly unsuccessful to bring this conflict to end and, uh, you know, uh, bring the peace and security in the region. Now, as uh, I have a very little time, uh, now I think uh, I have uh, made clear about the background of the issue. And I would like to go straight into the breach of uh, international laws by the sides in this conflict. First, uh, let's begin with the United Nations Charter uh, as an, uh, you know, the starting point for the customary international law. And Article 2, Section 4 of the United Nations Charter, it, uh, it clearly denotes that all members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state or in any other manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations. So now, through this uh, uh, very article, we see that the action uh, you know, by the Israel, uh, be it uh, during the 1967 uh, uh, Six Day War or the 1973 Yom Kippur War, when it uh, annexed the, uh, the so-called uh, the Palestinian region is uh, already uh, against the breach of the international law. Further, uh, we also see that uh, the fourth Geneva Convention, you know, in Article 49, Paragraph 6, it is clearly stated that the occupying power shall not deport or transport uh, parts of its own civilian population into 
territory it occupies. Now, by this, I mean, since the Israel has been occupying those states from uh, Palestinians, uh, the Israeli government has, uh, you know, uh, continued this, uh, this Jewish settlement in those occupied areas. So this particular article by uh, the fourth Geneva Convention, uh, it uh, relates to that fact that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, you know, I mean, the proliferation of Jewish people in that occupied areas is uh, totally against the international law. Again, uh, there have been a lot of uh, discussions or say the resolutions at uh, the United Nations Security Council and General Assembly, and a lot of uh, resolutions has been passed, and particularly Resolution 242 and uh, Resolution 476, it uh, denounces the Israeli action and urges it to stop all Jewish settlement and also to amend all measures and at the state of Jerusalem. And uh, uh, recently, I mean, say, uh, lately, uh, the resolution 2334 of 2016, it was heavily passed by uh, the vote of 14 to zero. Uh, and uh, we know that we have uh, 15 uh, members in a uh, security council, including permanent and uh, uh, temporary members. And uh, the one, uh, which abstained from the meeting was United, uh, United States. And this was the very first time in the history that the United Nations abstained or you know, supported the resolution by you know, not being present uh, in the passing of the resolution. It was uh, mostly because of the deteriorating relationship between the, uh, the then US President Barack Obama and uh, uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. But uh, apart from this, uh, United Nations, uh, uh, sorry, United States has uh, uh, say 42 times supported uh, uh, the cause of Israel and uh, vetoed any resolutions, you know, uh, which goes against the Israel. And uh, uh, and uh, other laws, uh, I mean, this case, the conflict, uh, this case has uh, even reached the International Criminal Court and uh, the Article 8 uh, to of the International Criminal Court uh, statutes defines the transfer or the say directly or indirectly by the occupying power of parts of its own civilian population into the territory it occupies is a war crime. And uh, I think uh, I already mentioned about this point. Uh, and uh, this has been uh, even you know, justified by the verdict of ICC. So this is also uh, clearly the breach of the international law by Israel. Uh, and. Uh, also, the Security Council has, in Resolution 446, determined that the policy and practices of Israel in establishing settlements in the Palestinian and other Arab territories occupied since 1967 have no legal validity. But uh, 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 till now, I only looked, uh, you know, uh, from the side uh, against the, the Israel, but. Uh, uh, looking at uh, the you know the side of Israel, Israel has its own say. It argues that uh, the United Nations Charter also provides the right to any state to take actions you know which it deems worthy in case of any potential threat to its uh, citizens, uh, territorial integrity or sovereignty, and hence uh, it justifies its action of establishing you know the almost 700 kilometer long wall, which is uh, 26 feet high in uh, uh, say the West Bank uh, uh, region, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, illegal as uh, you know, uh, said by the earlier decisions by the United Nations uh, resolutions and ICC. And uh, um, other supporting arguments Israel uh, uh, gives that, well, as a, uh, before 1967 war era, uh, no, I mean, the occupied territory did not have any, you know, uh, any sovereign state uh, ruling over that territory. So uh, any rule which is uh, deeming the occupying state, Israel here, you know, to respect the sovereignty or say the determination, self-determination of uh, the occupied nation is void because there was no any other sovereign state earlier. And uh, uh, it also, I mean, the Israel also gives, you know, the, the citing in uh, the religious uh, text historically, like uh, it is the voluntary returns of the Jews. I mean, the Jews, they have been, you know, entitled to the holy place of uh, the Israel. So 
it is a you know totally justified decision for them to return i'm sorry and there is one minute left only okay sure sure i'm almost uh, going to finish and now um well so i already talked about a lot of uh, international law breached by israel and uh, it's it's a counter argument now what next uh, uh, for for the conflict now uh, for this, I would like to quote uh, a famous uh, Palestinian uh, scholar, Nora Erakat, and she says, okay, uh, there have been a lot of international law and, uh, you know, agreements, but uh, CC gives, uh, you know, like uh, in a literary terms that uh, international law is nothing, but uh, it's just a cell and uh, the activities of the international organization, individuals, and all those activities are wind. And all wind can uh, do to the cell is give it a motion but not guarantee the direction. So uh, this situation can be only brought to halt or the uh, peace and prosperity be established uh, as long as the superpower, you know, how they decide in the coming days. So that will be all. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, uh, have a nice day. Thanks a lot for your presentation, dear Bishnu. And now we would like to proceed to our next speaker. This is Tanzim Ahmed, PhD candidate at Jawaharlal Nehru University, India. His topic is the modern states clash with the end of history. Thanks a lot. Um, am I audible? Yes. Yeah, I'm just going to share the screen. Uh, Yes, is it uh, visible? Yes, it's visible. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, and thank you, NICE and the chairperson for uh, giving me this opportunity to participate in this summit. So my topic is modern states clash with end of history. And I would primarily be focusing on uh, the crisis of the liberal narrative in uh, globally. And uh, so right now, so what we see is with the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, we see the notion of security for states is once again being guided by traditional notions, uh, such as strict fortification of borders and rigorous surveillance of their peripheries. And uh, <clears throat> so, and there have been many emergency-like measures which are usually reserved for wartime generally. And many far-right European leaders from Italy, Germany, France, they've called for suspension of Europe's open border system. Even Trump has another reason to build his wall in the Mexican border. So this outbreak provided anti-globalists with even more, even more of a conducive socio-political milieu to strengthen their arguments for close boundaries, claiming that they were right all along for contending such developments in the first place, and especially in Europe. So you see this uh, trend of uh, this change of trend from retreat of the state to the return of the state. And this resurgence of Westphalian sovereignty has become uh, more of an indication of the crisis of a liberal and globalized world order that was championed throughout the latter half of the 20th century. And uh, so one more thing is that this was not set in due to the coronavirus, but it was rather a a uh, political trend which was already in fashion before the outbreak of the pandemic, such as you have examples like US, uh, like Trump's administration, uh, his call to make America great again. You have the Brexit vote, you have V4 nations not wanting to entertain immigrants because they don't apparently uphold the value of uh, multiculturalism. And you know, even uh, India's noble engagement of reframing its image as a Hindu nation under the current NDA government, per se. So then let's understand what this liberal story means exactly. So you have this narrative of globalization, which had ushered in this uh, promise, promising potential of liberalism to address problems of economic barriers, uh, communication gaps, and issues with multiculturalism. And you know, it was the push towards a borderless world, uh, towards the experience of a shared existence and uh, to take from McLuhan uh, an idea of a global village. Or, and, the, and there was many, uh, a lot of 
significant progress made in fields of technology, literacy, and even considerable economic growth was seen. And this uh, idea was even championed by Fukuyama in his idea of end of history, where he argued that the last ideological uh, alternative to liberalism had been eliminated with the collapse of Soviet Union. And uh, liberalism will be marked as the most advanced and last ideological narrative in history. And then after that, the whole world was asked to uh, jump onto the liberal uh, wagon via the platform of liberalism. And the ideals of liberalism generally espoused was, uh, was that life under oppressive regimes would be a thing of the past. There was, there would be free enterprise, which would overcome economic restrictions and even transcending borders would curb the us and them divide. But then it turned out to be a double-edged sword because the onslaught of globalization also demanded that uh, race, ethnicity, culture, and other social identity markers take a backseat. You know, there was an identity crisis as in, you see immigration practices, uh, which was a phenomenon that the liberal story uh, encouraged had fallen on its own sword because it uh, bred antagonism and insecurity in host countries. And so then that is why you have globalization being confronted by economic and cultural nationalism today. And uh, local identity and sovereignty, both of which were, uh, both of which the international liberal order was thought to have subsumed are reasserting themselves every day now. Uh, anyway, uh, now, so then we see that to be brief, inequality, identity, and technology seem to have intersected in an ugly manner in the 21st century. Uh, and it has all led to this crisis of the liberal world order. Now, um, just to take a framework and a reference, Shashi Tharoor's and Samir Saran's book, the New World Disorder and the Indian Imperative released in early 2020. They have listed, uh, uh, they've given a list of five sub crises which make up the sum of uh, crisis of the liberal world order as a whole. And they were, uh, they are the crisis of legitimacy, of representation, of the collective, of identity, and of sovereignty. Now, uh, to me, the crisis of identity and sovereignty are particularly more important as they were triggered by the homogenization of un, uh, homogenization unleashed by the globalization. And in fact, this is what paved the way for the other crisis. You know, you have mass refugee population explosions, immigration movements, and international bodies and authorities were somewhat inadequate in their handling of these problems. So there was a distrust in international institutions. And in fact, the distrust had already seeped in, but it seemed to have hardened during you know, the last ongoing uh, decade. And then moreover, you have this realization of structural power and its abuse in the hands of some of the developing countries. And you have some of the hypocrisies of developing countries, such as uh, in the areas of multilateral, multilateral trade, there are questions of patents and access to medicine its high prices and the politics of its availability and affordability. On the other hand, you have this adverse effect, in effect of climate change and skewed greenhouse gas emissions, the selective interventionism of peacekeeping forces. So all of this, they, you know, they lead to a crisis of legitimacy. You know, there's a lack of representation supposedly in lesser and underdeveloped countries, a lack of their voice. And so then you have the emergence of more newer region specific institutions like BRICS, IBSA, and even the G20 for that matter. And, uh, or, you know, economic institutions like Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank or the New Development Bank of BRICS as an alternative to the World Bank. So uh, all these developments, uh, it seems to indicate that the idea of international security was merely a function of converging or competing interests of select group of nations. And, uh, you know, if you look at it, the legitimacy and universal, universality of these institutions of the post-World War II era were very clearly underwritten by USA. So then you have this utter lack of faith in global governing institutions and in security notions such as collective security or responsibility to protect, which you know, seem to reveal that they're more of a hollow concept. 
because they are used only when convenient to particular interests. And hence you have this crisis of the collective and all this together, uh, they indicate the crisis of the liberal world order as a whole. And uh, they were already there before the pandemic and it just seemed to have hardened. Yeah, and which is why you have states turning inwards and focusing on security individually. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> all of this then, uh, as I've indicated, all of this together uh, is what comprises of the crisis of the liberal narrative. And uh, so then what we see here is that then it is not the end of history. Okay, because uh, it's a point that even Fukuyama himself has acknowledged, uh, where he argues that the desire of identity groups for recognition is a key threat. Because it has engendered a feeling of irre irre irrelevance in many individuals. And uh, because while liberalism and globalization has indeed helped them make help make the world a smaller and easier place. Uh, it has also eased channels of migration and the identities of people as a group appears to have had a re retreating effect. There's a loosening effect and the ensuing fear of further loosening of these roots is what has compelled these people to resurrect their borders once again. So in most people who generally voted for Trump or Brexit or Narendra Modi, they did not reject the liberal package in entirety. They lost faith mainly in its globalizing part, actually. And then you see, that's why you see the modern states in compatibility with the liberal narrative today. You have many examples like U.S.'s retreat from international platforms, U.S.'s hostility towards WHO during the pandemic. Apart from Brexit, you have the rise of AFD in Germany, National Rally in France, Storm, Storm Kurs hardline, uh, which is uh, the far-right Danish political party in Sweden, and even assertions of India and China for that matter. And that's why you have, what you see is security is no more believed to be a collective endeavor in today's times. On a, on a concluding note, say what I would like to point out is that, or we need to inquire why the behavior of states have been so individualistic or self-serving or hostile to foreign people is not simply because of the crisis of liberal narrative, but the lack of an alternative narrative altogether. And so you all know Harari's book, 2018 book, uh, the first line in it is he says that humans think in stories rather than in facts, numbers and equations. And the simpler the story, the better. So every person, group or nation have their own tales and myths. Now the discourse of 20th century they presented the world with three grand stories. The fascist story, communist story, and the liberal story, you know, to explain the whole past and predict the future. The fascist story collapsed with the end of Second World War. Uh, in the, from 1940s to 1980s, you have the communist story and the liberal story battling one another in the guise of Cold War to prove themselves as the better narrative. And then the communist story also collapsed with the disintegration of USSR and the liberal story emerged victorious. But now we have a crisis of the liberal story as well. And hence, uh, you know, he sums it up this moment of crisis of liberal narrative very well in one line, where he says in 1938, humans were offered three global stories to choose from. In 1968, just two. In 1999, 1998, a single story seemed to prevail, and in 2018, we are down to zero. So this lack of alternative global narrative altogether seems to have forced states to turn inwards, and in fact, look at themselves individually set apart from the global narrative or international system. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Dieter and Jim, for presenting this theoretical framework uh, during our panel uh, on defense uh, and security, and hoping to proceed to it later during Q&A session. And now I'm glad to present our next speaker. This is Neha Duen, consultant at UNISCA Cluster of South Asia and chair of Indian Women International Relations Forum, India. Uh, the topic uh, of her presentation is uh, Novel Perspectives on Securitization, Statehood Post-COVID-19. And talking about women in international relations, I'm glad to see that NIS hosts a rather gender-balanced 
panels and there are a lot of women moderators and a lot of women scholars and practitioners. So thanks a lot for this uh, opportunity. Thank you so much, Dr. Anna, and also thank you, Dr. Jaswal. I'm just going to start sharing my screen. So you just we can see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, brilliant. Then uh, I will also time myself just to make sure that we don't overrun it. So I'll just start now. Uh, thank you, everyone, and good morning from Cambridge, United Kingdom. I'm succinctly presenting on my research titled Novel Perspectives on Securitization, Statehood Post COVID 19. So I examined a set of state responses from a selection of countries around the world to understand how states responded to the crisis, uh, surging crisis of COVID-19, particularly looking at how state leaders, office holders, and heads of government and states re reacted to the surging crisis. And I employed narrative and normative deconstruction to understand intentionality, and particularly the philosophical tradition of speech acts, which is posited by the Cambridge School of Intellectual History, particularly Pocock and Skinner, to understand what are the ontological and hermeneutical origins of statements, particularly in IR, which is a new perspective, because usually we take IR as a hard security matter for what it is. But this perspective understands, uh, helps us understand what it ought to be and whether there is anything like an objective construction of security. And there were two observations that came up. One was that there were patterns which could be observed between geographically very distant and also politically very different systems like the United States, Brazil, India, Hungary, Israel and many others. And secondly, across all of these, there was an extensive use and preponderance of wartime analogies during the rise of the pandemic. Oh, sorry, I think. There we go. So, for instance, uh, Donald, take for example, President Donald Trump, who has been using the war narrative quite often. And on March 18, during the initial months of the uh, pandemic itself, where the focus should have been on the US healthcare system, President Trump declared himself a wartime president. Likewise, you could see narratives of mythological wars, but for example, the Mahabharata war in India, accompanied by a call to arms. For example, when Prime Minister Modi called on the women of the nation to sell their jewelry like they would in actual times of war crisis or as they did during the Indo-Pakistan wars of the last century. Likewise, in Israel, the call to the six-day war, China, even when COVID was a public health emergency of international concern and not a pandemic, China declared Wuhan a heroic city and started using Mao's ideas of a people's war. Likewise, in Bangladesh, on the eve of the Independence and National Day, there was an invocation of a witch sentiment in a nationalist spirit. So I also further conducted a analysis and aggregated Google search data during the initial months of the pandemic onwards into April 2020 to understand what the trends look like. And as expected, there was a great dominance of terms relating to war, for instance, battle, enemy, invisible enemy war, uh, in context of, of course, COVID-related information. And this interestingly also correlated with data from news searches, Google news searches, further indicating that uh, official state media houses, news media have been capitalizing on the use of war terminology, which was coming from state officials because state media was a large channel and state officials were the primary contact of communication during the surgence of the crisis, which naturally begged the question, why use wartime analogies in a health crisis? as it is not an intuitive response. So further to understand that, we look at the interrelationship of wartime semantics with extreme measures that have been introduced in a number of states around the world. And secondly, what I did was contrast these official narratives emerging from offices, official offices, with actual preparedness on ground of healthcare systems or emergency or uh, disaster control measures. And this fits in very well with the securitization theory given by Barry Buzan, Ole Weaver, and Jabzi Wild in 1998, which looks at the construction of threats as existential threats to the survival of the state through, the, through both the theory and process of securitization, which basically implies that an actor a securitizing agent, an actor in power, usually a government head or official, would construct the threat as such to be a threat to the existence of the state itself. And in this case, uh, Barry Bazan et al. had 
given this theory, posited it across five sectors, being military, political, societal, environmental, and economic. And I look at a noble perspective of it, which is a health crisis in the 21st century. And what this tells us are further implications on the nature of the state subject relationship, statehood, and international security paradigms to follow. Because there are two reasonings for why this could be contextualized. The first was the consolidation of power. Because as per securitization and in line with state narratives, what the narrative which came out from the state offices was that due to the COVID-19 pandemic as being a threat to national state survival and national security, states need to act with all means necessary. And this does not stop at that. It extends into the idea that these measures can be best enforced or instituted by those incumbent at that time, therefore consolidating their past further. And the second narrative that underpins this, uh, my theory and analysis, is that the combative state discourse comes from mustering of nationalism and supporting nationalism further. To, to facilitate the understanding of this more, if you look at the case of Israel, for example, where the Knesset was shut right before Netanyahu's corruption trial, Hungary, where the uh, Viktor Orban led Fidesz uh, government instituted emergency laws without sunset clauses, Poland, where Andrei Duda uh, insisted on elections being held in May, which were rescheduled for later with a low voter turnout. But he insisted that despite a 30% voter turnout, elections go because votes were supposed to be in his favor with almost 70%, unlike the actual 50% that he got. Authoritarianism has also been on the rise. So if someone has come across the photos of Cyril Ramphosa from South Africa wearing his military regalia as a state official calling on citizens to abide by measures otherwise alternatives would be imposed. Likewise, we've even seen statements where state officials have gone out and said that we will shoot, shoot citizens on site if they're seen uh, out in public, for example, looking at Duterte's statements. And likewise, there have been increases in surveillance regimes, police brutalities, armies have been stormed into cities, and all in the name of a COVID-19 related uh, control measures. Even in countries like France and UK, we see war terminology, for example, France insisting on an operation resilience, unlike any other op military operation they've ever had, withdrawing their troops from Iraq is a consequence. In the United Kingdom, it's a similar terminology of war plans, battle plans, and situation rooms being constructed with doctors. Interestingly, this analysis and further correlates with data by the Oxford uh, COVID response tracker, government response tracker. And you can see from this map, for instance, that the greater the stringency measure is, is very similar to the greater the use of war terminologies and cases I've illustrated. For example, India in South Asia, the United States, which all rank higher on stringency and therefore control. And the danger to democracy has been su to such great an extent that even the UN systems have called upon making sure that states oblige to their international agreements, to international human rights instruments, and most importantly, exert proportionality and exertion of security measures in response to health crisis. So therefore, giving it a concluding and a comparative picture when we put this in context of how did those fare well who did not go towards war cries. So if we, for example, look at the lauded cases of South Korea and New Zealand, we observe that New Zealand, for instance, under the Arden government, has been mobilizing its community through a very different language. For example, calling upon New Zealanders to join as a team of 5 million individuals to help their neighbors. And that is the same tone which is resonating in, the, in their foreign policy, where they have collaborated, collaborated with the WHO to help the Pacific region in crisis preparedness, contact tracing, and other best practices have been shared, unlike many other countries which have become more reclusive and even withdrawn support to the WHO. South Korea, again, the proof is in the language. For instance, in South Korea, they had the largest voter turnout for the National Assembly voting in April 2020 in the last 28 years because the this individuals approved of the state's language. The uh, Even President Moon Jae-in used the anniversary of his third year in office to empower local bodies and administrations. And likewise, with the G7 survey, you can see that the New Zealand Prime Minister's ratings have been up upwards of 88% in public perception, unlike the rest of the G7 countries which have been touched upon, which barely lay at about 50 to 59%. Therefore, the main key argument of this uh, 
presentation is that the construction of security is not in isolation and the construction of security in a health crisis as an emergency measure will have lasting consequences of surveillance and will alter the state subject relationship and state conduct as well. Thank you very much. I think that's just about in time. Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks a lot for being in time, dear Nyaha. And also, as for me, it's also very interesting uh, to see how the states are trying to find the right balance between their national interests in the dealing with crisis and uh, with the, all of their humanitarian aid efforts with their nation branding uh, interests uh, where is the right uh, balance between internal domestic audience and with the external uh, target audience so it's rather a complicated issue for all the states and maybe we would come back to it during Q&A session because I suppose that some time would be left for it. And thanks a lot, Dianeha, for this wonderful presentation. And now we would like to proceed to our next speaker. And this is Dr. Binay Kumar Patak, Assistant Professor at Lalit Narayan Medila University, India. The topic of the presentation is public-private partnerships and implications for security. Thank you, Madam Chair. Let me first thank the organizers, uh, NICE, Dr. Jaiswal and his team for giving me this opportunity to present uh, my work, which is not yet finished, but I'm working on it before this learned audience. Uh, what I want wish to share is public-private partnerships and implications for security. When I am using this word, uh, I will I would like to uh, clarify what I mean by public and private partnership as a means of association between economics and politics. When I mean economics is the activities of production and distribution, and politics is the political system or political establishment. And I will go through these development and come to the present state that is rise of populist governments in most of the countries of the world. And then the kind of partnership I wish to focus, the kind of tacit partnerships I wish to focus and their implications. So uh, economy and polity working together is not a new thing. This was in place even before, uh, even before the classical system emerged. What we know as mercantilism, where wealth of nations was the primary objective and, and the monarch kings, they agreed that increasing wealth of nations will serve all the purposes of distribution. So the focus was, on, was there. And we know the shift flag metaphor, where one is said to be leading the other, is in a way that ship here represents the international trade. So international trade was supported by the, the countries where industrial revolution took place earlier. And in return, the revenue generated out of this trade was helping this, these, these countries to, to get new colonies or to expand. Then uh, the classical system emerged, which actually tried for establishing economy as a as an independent entity which can regulate itself we know adam smith's uh, fridge that invisible hand controls market but then with the independence of economy or market being claimed another version came and we know different forms of Economies, one controlled by government, which is which we know as socialist or planned economies, then market economies. And it was argued that government's role in economy might actually cloud out private investments. So if countries want to reap benefits of market, government should better backtrack from economic activities. But as Government is can be attributed to failures because of the work culture, because of the kinds of hierarchies, because of the bureaucracies. Market also is can also has also been uh, accused of inefficiencies inherent in it, monopoly tendencies, and 
its inefficiency to address problems of distribution. So there have been government failure, there have been market failure from both sides. Then something called mixed economy emerged, or more or less all kinds of economies were some some kind of mixed economy in differing degrees. Then. Uh, in private sector emerged in the garb of neoliberalism and uh, there were there were there have been instances of creating a space for market or private sector even in the areas where they were not present for example health education water electricity the, the examples are many and public private partnership triple p's have become uh, become a very fashionable word there are instances of its success, there are instances of its failures, but in these instances, one thing which, which came up was that the success story of private sector or the market was not because of its contribution to production or distribution, rather because of its tacit uh, role played by political class to help in accruing profit to the private sector. And this is where these crony capitalism, this uh, this concept emerge. But my idea, when I am going to look at these partnerships, I am trying to add something more to it. That's why I am not using the term crony capitalism. Uh, in the because I even I don't have some part, uh, a particular term or phrase to name it. So I have actually used the the concept of public-private partnership, where I will try to add the dimensions or the forms which I mean before before you all. So we know the, by the, by, uh, 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 from the 80s, uh, the rise of populist governments in many countries of the world emerged and which generally feeds on the unfulfilled promises of the welfare state, which was a failure on the kind of polity or the government and also neoliberalism, the market promises that market can solve everything. So both these entities accrued failures and uh, these populist government emerged as a solution. So what has not been done, we will do it. But we see in most of the countries, these populist governments have no alternate agenda, something new that they can do. What they do is either they follow the the existing kind of economic practices or uh, what has happened is this private or the market entities and the political class, they have entered into tacit kind of agreements or tacit kind of partnership to support existence of each other, which I will, I will, I will mention some of the examples and some of the illustrations. On the other hand, triple P's, which were supposed, which were supposed to supposed to address this problem, that government failure will be will be addressed by market, and market failure will be addressed by government. But that has not happened. In fact, both have started taking benefit of each other, and both these entities. When I say government, I say both the political establishment and the political parties in power. So it's not only, so it's a mix of, mix of two. That's why I'm using the word public for better, for being able to convey it better. And these kind of tacit agreements have implications for social and human security. Why? Because at the domestic level, what we can see because of these collusions, consolidation of power and power for political establishments is happening when these private entities are helping uh, through many things. Maybe it may be issue of electoral bonds, bonds in India, where, where certain political party can get abysmal kind of funding from certain private parties, which can be benefited if, the, if that certain political party wins after election, or it may be maybe using resources of the private entity in establishing political campaigning. So, there are these kind of tendencies and for the private party it, this is concentration of monopoly tendencies where the political class helps these private entities which have helped the political class to gain over to have mergers acquisitions which were hitherto not 
accepted or not imagined with existing laws and regulations. So these two phenomena, consolidation of power and concentration of monopoly tendencies at domestic level, at the international level, what is happening, these political establishments and these and uh, their nexus with corporate entities overriding national interests. National governments advocating for their own companies during their negotiations with other countries again not new. But now what is happening is these negotiations are going beyond the national interest. The interest of these private entities and the political capital class is getting more attention or more importance than the important than the national interest. Uh, some examples illustration might be which we know the nexus between uh, political establishments and social media organizations which are MNCs they operate in different countries regarding political campaigning there are there have been issues there have been issues in USA there is the issue in India which is being debated which is being reported so here the social media owner is a private entity is a, is a private party so these kind of pollutions I want to bring about then during international agreements to favor a certain private entity political system goes beyond national interest and this adds not only new dimensions to crony capitalism but also establishes before us that in terms of economy transfer of resources undermining production and distribution in, econ in economics we give em emphasis on production and distribution and not through income generated through transfer but when these private entities are not contributing anything to production and distribution, they get they are getting mainly from transfer. That is not contributing anything substantially. So in this scenario, we see ship which represented international trade, or we can say the private party is undermining flag, which represents national interest. Thank you for this opportunity. I I would like to take questions during discussion. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, dear Dr. Patak, for your wonderful presentation, and thanks you for being in time. And now we would like to proceed to our uh, today's last but not least speaker, and this is Nayanika Duta, student of Manipal University, India. The topic of the presentation is insurgency and counterinsurgency in Northeast India in search of peace and stability in Indian national security. And also, if there are questions for Q&A session, please, dear viewers, write it here in the chat box. Thanks a lot. Thank you, ma'am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, yeah, one second. Uh, ma'am, the uh, screen has just shut, uh, but I'm not sure if you can still see me or hear me. We, 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 we can see you and we can hear you, but we can see your screen. Okay. Um, Ma'am, is it better now? Yeah. Yes, now, yes, now we can see your screen. Okay, thank you. So a yeah. uh, very uh, good evening to all. This is me, Narika Datta, joining from Assam, India. Uh, first, this, uh, first things first, I would like to extend my thanks and gratitude uh, to the niece, uh, nice family for giving me this wonderful platform. I am truly uh, blessed, happy and honored to be a part of this. So to begin with, as you can see, uh, the topic of my presentation today is um, insurgency and counterinsurgency in Northeast in uh, search of peace and stability in India's national uh, security. So um, I've just tried my best to sort of simplify this whole uh, paper and uh, just talk about the objectives and their respective findings. Um, so I mean, uh, we'll, yeah. So moving on to the slide with the objectives. Uh, first, we're gonna try and understand the causes and origins of militancy in Northeast. Then we'll uh, look at the changing manifestations of the insurgent groups in the region. Third, we'll be looking at uh, the state's responses to um, insurgency in this region. And lastly, we'll try and assess the challenges in the Northeast. 
So to talk about the causes, I think uh, geography is one uh, very important factor which I cannot ignore because the whole region is surrounded by uh, five countries, uh, which makes it very easy and convenient for the rackets of uh, drug and human trafficking and arms smuggling to sort of uh, 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 especially from um, Bangladesh, we can refer to the example of Tripura, uh, where uh, the percentage of um, Tripuri tribals reduced from 64% to 33% in to, uh, 2011 and has been reducing even more in the recent years. Figures like this only show that the composition of tribal population um, of the region is deeply affected and so are their rights, which is one reason why uh, these groups come into form in the first place. Uh, most of them sort of demand, uh, you know, um, protection of their rights, whereas um, there are so many which uh, seek to, you know, uh, uh, sort of bring back and recover the lost rights. Also, there's a uh, strong sense of mutual distrust and uh, exclusiveness, particularly with the outsiders, uh, which is a result of the age-old uh, exploit, uh, exploitation um, that the British did. Uh, the British had actually made the whole region into a single political unit, but had put in place uh, so many segregating policies that uh, infused uh, a sense of division between the hill and the plain tribes. So uh, this region also lacks um, homogeneity since the people uh, living in this um, part of India belongs to multiple tribal backgrounds, uh, I mean, culture, religion, and so on and so forth. So there is always a need to protect them, uh, protect them and their individual community rights, which is why, you know, uh, these groups also support some, some sort of, uh, you know, um, support from the locals. Um, so now to talk about the changing, uh, manifestations i think the demands of um, have ranged from uh, you know demand for self governance to demands for rights to even demanding independence from the uh, state of india uh, now to look at a case manipur's unlf sought for political autonomy and statehood earlier but after having uh, granted statehood uh, right now in present times they are demanding the protection of tribal rights for their communities uh, moving on, the state's responses um, and its containment strategy has mostly um, revolved around modernizing the weapons for state uh, state police forces, communication systems, and training facilities. Uh, and um, so, I mean, under the central government scheme for modernization of state police forces of uh, 2001, all northeastern states were put under category one, which uh, which um, provided for 100% central funding. Then uh, comes the AFSPA of 1958, which uh, serves as an important legal weapon that grants special powers to the forces of the state to sort of maintain public order um, in the disturbed areas. Now, the government is also very keen on uh, maintaining very uh, friendly um, bi bilateral relations with <coughs> Myanmar to um, control militancy in Northeast. In fact, in 2003, the Royal uh, Royal Army of Bhutan had uh, carried out a mission to flush out all the separatist uh, groups from the southern part of Bhutan. Peace talks and negotiations have been a part of uh, the counterinsurgency strategy and have also result, uh, I mean, fetched uh, a few results. For example, peace talks uh, with the MNF of uh, Mizoram had ended all forms of insurgency back in 1980s and another peaceful settlement uh, witnessed is between the government of Assam and the um, NDFB, the National Democratic Front of Boroland, uh, that led the state to declare Boro as the official um, language of the Boro districts of Assam. Now to talk about the uh, challenges, I think uh, cross-border linkages is a major problem. The government of India had accused China and Myanmar of the involvement in uh, supporting militancy in the region through funds and training activities. Uh, reports also suggest that Pakistan had uh, been involved in uh, training the Naga gorillas back in 1960. Uh, now, the biggest challenge in today's time and age is the growth of radical Islamist organizations in the region. This poses a major security uh, threat, uh, national security threat. And of course, uh, I mean, most of them are currently operating uh, 
in um, Mizoram, uh, sorry, uh, Manipur, Assam, and Tripura, and some have been assisting. Uh, uh, I mean, um, radical Muslims to come to India via the Indo uh, Bangladesh border. Uh, they are now expanding to the nearby states of Meghalaya and Nagaland as well. Now, to conclude, uh, I have a few recommendations to make. Uh, the first one would be um, infrastructural um, improvement and upliftment of socio-economic conditions of the locals here in this region is a key solution to most problems, including poverty and. And um, uh, I mean, the actress policy is uh, definitely a take in the right direction because uh, there are so many uh, projects like the Kaladan multimodal uh, transit route, uh, route and the trilateral highway that uh, connects India to Thailand and Myanmar. So these these um, projects are definitely going to, um, uh, I mean, uh, sort of reduce the physical divide between mainland India and Northeast India and uh, and will also connect uh, India to the larger Southeast Asia. Now with peace talks and ceasefire uh, agreements, violence has been brought under control. Uh, even then there are many non-signatory ceasefire groups that uh, exist even today who have the potential to um, disrupt the peaceful um, negotiations and the goals of the act peace policy. Therefore, peace talks need to be in uh, continuation and society large also needs to be involved because uh, this only brings about a very um, respectable form of communication uh, that helps in a win-win situation both the sides for all the stakeholders in this battle lastly ending with a very broad uh, generic but a legit uh, recommendation that is proper border management and um, controlled migration and infiltration that's it thank you so much Yananika, thanks a lot for this insightful presentation. And uh, I would like to particularly thank our uh, presenters, uh, students. I would like uh, to thank you for your wonderful work uh, during these difficult COVID times when you sometimes do not have opportunity to visit your campuses. And I would like to thank uh, your professors and all uh, lecturers who are working with you, who assist you in this difficult period of time. And now we have about five to seven minutes left for our questions, and I would like to read the question of our esteemed panelist Anna Nat, Dr. Anna Nat, to our speaker Tanzim Ahmed. It sounds like uh, it's true that liberalism poses more challenges for huma to humanity. However, it has been the most successful theory to date that sustained. But there is no alternative to it, as you discussed. Hypernationalism is emerging as an alternative. Countries are taken to happen nationalism. Let's happen nationalism reject liberalism. Please, a uh, brief answer to the question. Yes, um, uh, thank you for that question. Um, now, to answer in simplistic terms, as in, in a, as it does, hypernationalism re reject liberalism. Um, the problem of being an academic is I can't say yes or no to that directly or because uh, it is yes and no both, and also neither of them at the same time. Because yes, hypernationalism does reject liberalism, but not entirely. Uh, <clears throat> you have this concept of illiberal democracies coming up today, uh, which is a new word. And to quote myself from my presentation is, most people who voted for Trump, Brexit, or Modi did not uh, reject the liberal narrative entirely, but they lost faith in its globalizing aspect, mostly, per se. But yes, of course, liberalism is facing a crisis um, on both socio, socio cultural front as well as an, uh, on the economic front. But what you see more is uh, it's more aggravated on the socio cultural front today, per se. Uh, briefly, I would like to have a more elaborate discussion on this, but since you've asked me to. Uh, restrict my comments, then I'll just say this much. That's it. So one more thing, just uh, the, lib the, the problem with liberalism is that the liberal order has been now established somewhat of a myth because it was neither liberal and nor orderly. And also to say that hypernationalism is not an alternative to liberalism per se. It's not a global narrative and at least not as of yet. It was, it's in fact, turning away from somewhat of a global narrative. Thank you. 
Thanks a lot, dear Anzim. And now we have a question for Dr. Anna Nast, Nat uh, from our esteemed panelist Neha Duan. And it sounds like, thank you for your presentation. Your presentation raises an inquiry into whether culturally and historically linked partnerships like the Commonwealth SARC can be leveraged in the India security paradigm. If not, to what extent do such partnerships aid India's foreign policy agenda? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Neha, for the question. Uh, as I see that we are talking, if we look at SARC, I think out of all this uh, different regional cooperation, SARC doesn't fare that well. So SARC, uh, in terms of a lot of uh, objectives, SARC has really not performed up to the mark. And uh, many see SARC as a fail arrangement. You know, nothing comes out of SARC meetings. That the Indian government also doesn't attend, uh, takes the SARC seriously. And I have stopped sending much of the higher elite uh, delegates. Uh, if you're looking at uh, what extent do partnerships aid India's foreign policy? In India, the foreign policy is quite a very evolved uh, and a very uh, dynamic kind of an uh, arrangement. And if you look at partnership, partnerships really work in Indian scenario because uh, India never has one systematic and you know kind of one side uh, aspects. India basically looks at a partnership like whether uh, one of the panelists have discussed about PPP model. So we have the PPP model quite a lot and looking at how India is going for privatization and partnership is something that India looks at. But uh, India remodels its partnership based on uh, different countries and based on different situations. I think wherever India feels this two plus two strategic benefit will all about national interest, India goes. Then there are many uh, multi-sectoral arrangements. So India is a part of it. But the, uh, but the basic underlining thing is how much is India committed to it? How much is any country committed to it? How far do they break the arrangement? So uh, the point that you raised is partnership. Does it work for India foreign policy? Yes, it certainly works for India's foreign policy. And India should invest a lot in that. But uh, the commitment of any country from taking from planning to execution is more important. So I think uh, that is a question as I've understood. And uh, Commonwealth, yes, uh, we are one of the founder countries of Commonwealth in India with a lot of privileges that we got, which no other country has got. Uh, we do not have to comply by a lot of Commonwealth terms and conditions. But uh, in today's time, we are not uh, looking too much about the Commonwealth arrangement. We have so many alternative arrangements. So basically, India is trying to capitalize on those arrangements. So I think India's foreign policy is very dynamic. We have been very strategic and very uh, you know, uh, whether we need to adopt hard power, soft power, we've done it all and we're doing it all. But uh, yes, to a lot of uh, uh, aspects, situational based, case study based approach, we have to see that what is India really doing. SARC and India doesn't do really well together. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Nat. Now we have about uh, five minutes left uh, because I would like to uh, have organizers uh, about five minutes before the next session because uh, I don't know, it's an incredible work uh, to host this conference online for three days and uh, without any break, breaks. And now I would like to give about 30 seconds uh, for concluding remarks to all the our distinguished panelists. So maybe in the way as you were speaking at first, Priyanka, some, just some brief concluding remarks, please. If someone wishes. Uh, I just have a short question for Priyanka. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, th uh, I think it was Priyanka from Northwest, uh, if I'm not wrong. Uh, the last one, uh, the president. Uh, I would just like to know how much does uh, how much has peace talks in Northeast successfully addressed the problems in Northeast? Uh, do we see peace talks in Northeast the way it has been conducted between border uh, states? Has it really worked for Northeast development and uh, prosperity? I'm sorry, it's my before for Nayanika, the question. Nayanika, yeah, sorry. Yeah, Nayanika, uh, yeah. Sorry, ma'am, could you please repeat the question? Uh, Nayanika, I'm sorry, the question is for you that you did yeah. mention peace talks are very essential looking at the conflict between border states in Northeast and then Northeast and other regions in India. But how, how much do you think this uh, success rate of peace talks have been? Because a lot of peace movements over the time in Northeast has either been withdrawn or uh, either been uh, in a very strategic way, the government has taken over with Naga Accord and everything else. 
then manipur contract and arm force you know aspa so yes these stocks Thanks. need not work yes and uh, please only about uh, 20 30 seconds for the answer because the next session will start soon mm -hmm. okay um hello so ma'am um ma i guess you just wanted to know how uh, p stocks have uh, fared till date right ma'am if i'm not wrong yes uh, okay so uh, p stocks i mean uh, not in um, not for all the cases but i mean uh, back in the 1980s we we of course saw how the uh, mizo national front uh, and the government had uh, had a peaceful settlement after mizoram had uh, I mean, was granted statehood. Uh, right now, the Naga Peace Accord is uh, is on the headlines, of course. But uh, I mean, so, so I mean, uh, there's no right or wrong answer to this. But I see that a peaceful negotiation is a way out, and it's uh, it takes a lot of time. But uh, that is uh, one one way to reach settlements. So right now, in uh, Northeast, uh, ma'am, I mean, the peace talks between the. Um, Government of Assam and Alpha uh, did have, uh, I mean, uh, did fetch uh, a few results because right now um, insurgency in Assam is very minimum. Uh, we we only see a lot of uh, new sort of radical Islamist organizations coming into the zone. So the uh, trajectory from uh, you know uh, demand for political autonomy has now uh, changed its course to like various other demands. So uh, and again, internal conflicts in the organizations are are very rampant. So uh, I, I mean, there are so many complexities to this issue. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, I would like uh, to thank all our esteemed panelists, and I would like uh, to thank Nice for hosting this wonderful conference, giving us opportunity to meet in these times, and giving opportunity to wonderful uh, and uh, wonderful young scholars and practitioners their, this opportunity to meet online, and hoping this that one day uh, you will become distinguished uh, professors or wonderful leaders of international national relations think tanks and uh, that uh, you will govern your countries towards prosperity and towards uh, cooperation uh, with uh, each other and uh, is, is there a spokesperson from Nice who should, who should uh, give some summer summer of the meeting Shreya, are you there i'll be carrying the vote of thanks okay Distinguished chair, speakers, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the 27th session. It is my honor to propose a vote of thanks on behalf of NICE to all those who have graced us with our presence and contributed their parts to make this event a resounding success. First of all, we would like to express our profound gratitude and sincere thanks to Dr. Anna Valikia for agreeing to chair and moderate the session today. Our sincere thanks also goes to our speakers for being a part of the event and delivering such a comprehensive and convincing presentation. We are really honored to have all the speakers with us here today. We would like to acknowledge our gratitude to our friends from the diplomatic community, experts, academia, media, and different organizations. Finally, I must mention our deep sense of appreciation for audience who participated in the webinar and those who are watching this live on our YouTube channel. Thank you for your valuable time and attention and for making the session productive with your questions. We are truly honored to have you all with us this evening and hope to stay connected with you in future as well. It's really been a pleasure. Also, do join us at our next session. Thank you. Thanks.